Welcome. Welcome to the mini master classes from PMs for PMs. Uh, now, this is a product tank event and a blue chili event, so kind of a crossover production. Uh, I'll be your host for tonight. Uh, I'm the product tank Sydney co organizer. Uh, my co organizer, uh, Adrienne, can't be here tonight, unfortunately. She is in Korea having a long vacation. Good for her. Um, all right, so tonight we're going to have five quick masterclasses by various different product managers at Blue Chili. It's going to go from personas to business models to how to actually kick off things with developers um, and all sorts of uh, other useful stuff. Now, uh, I hope you have drinks, food, everything. Um, so all this stuff, uh, the venue, the speakers, food, drinks, etc., it's all sponsored by, by Blue Chili. And the event definitely wouldn't happen without rock stars like George, who's hiding behind there, Philippa, uh, the whole product management team, which has helped to, uh, to, uh, to put this event on. Would you like to give them a little bit of a, an applause? Yes? Awesome. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Uh, now, the talk is So uh, in terms of like slides and like what people say, you don't have to take notes. Um, but we've got a little camera over there. Um, and, uh, and so you can, um, you can review the talks later on. Uh, in terms of logistics, bathrooms, just behind this wall. No need to raise your hand if you need to go, just go. Um, fire exits, of course, that way, um, just the way you came in. All right. I wasn't allowed slides tonight, so these are my minimum viable slides. Um, all right. Now, uh, the event is free. Um, the PMs have lot, put a lot of effort into it. Uh, what we're going to do is, if you enjoy the talks, if you enjoy the food, etc. So if you could donate to Oz Harvest, that's a, uh, that's a course that we're supporting. Not everyone is as lucky as us to kind of have all this free food lying around. Um, so Shower, one of our product managers, is a big supporter of Oz Harvest. Do you want to say a couple of words about why you support them? Um, so Oz Harvest is a really amazing charity. They started when a woman in hospitality was really um, upset by all the food waste that went on. So she went around to restaurants collecting food at the end of the night and started making food for the homeless. I think they collect 18 tons of food every week, otherwise been thrown out and donated to charity. So it's a really worthy cause uh, and encouraging mm -hmm. to donate um, right before Christmas. Thank you. Um, I used to go to in London to free comedy nights um, at. Is anyone from London here? By any chance? Yeah, yeah, a couple of people live there. Uh, all right, if you haven't been, there's a comedy club. Uh, usually the nights are free. At the end, they ask for, for a donation. They say, you know, usually the nights are worth about $10. Uh, if you don't have $10, uh, do five. If you don't have $5, do two. If you don't have $2, don't worry about it. You probably need it more than we do, uh, or than, than all service does, maybe. Um, but it's, it's a really awesome organization. So if you enjoy the master classes tonight, if you take something off, if you think there was something of value, um, donate, and we'd be happy for it. Alrighty. Uh, now, we're going to do this thing a little bit interactive. So there's going to be a few uh, questions that you can answer each of the speakers. So they'll do about 10, 15 minutes or so of presentation, and there'll be Q&A afterwards. So it'll be fairly quick paced. Um, and, uh, and on uh, Twitter, if you still use Twitter, um, you can ask for questions and, uh, and get engaged. Uh, just use the hashtag BlueChili, and, uh, and one of our tools will pick that up and will facilitate that. Um, and that's it. Uh, that's, that's it for me for now. Uh, we'll get into our first talk, um, which, is, uh, which is Alejandro, uh, on kick-ass kickoffs. Cool. Woo! All right. How's it going, guys? Welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm Alejandro Patterson. I'm one of the uh, product managers here at Blue Chili, um, and I'm here to talk to you about kick-ass kickoffs. But before I get started, hmm, that's the wrong way. That's right. Cool. Awesome. I wanted to know a little bit about you guys, so I can customize my presentation uh, to help you guys get as much out of it as possible. So, um, how many of you guys work as a project manager? One. How about a product manager? Hey, okay, cool, awesome. How many of you are designers? Cool, and developers? Ooh, okay, cool, yep, partial hand there, awesome, nice. 
All right, so um, I'm going to ask you guys that are PMs to help me along the way. Uh, hopefully, you guys are going to uh, see the process that we're going through and see yourselves in it. Um, and hopefully, you also learn a few things along the way. So uh, who wants to tell me what a kickoff meeting is? Okay, cool. Anybody else? <laughs> okay, a kickoff meeting is an opportunity to bring context to your team so that you can make a great product right? or run an excellent project if you are not building a product. I'm going to talk today about building products because that's what we do here at Blue Chili. Um, and you can translate what we're talking about into projects as well. So you may be delivering something different to a product. Um, all right. Can someone tell me what the biggest failings are in a bad kickoff meeting? You guys know what happens when you have a bad kickoff meeting? Yeah, definitely. And usually not at the beginning. And that's the thing, is if you do not set the construct right of the conversation that you're having, and everyone's pulling in the same direction, then you're not going to get the outcomes that you're looking for. All right, so this is me. I'm recently arrived in Sydney, well, almost seven months now. Uh, I'm a product manager here at Blue Chili, um, and I have a little bit of a diverse background. I was born in Costa Rica, uh, and at 16, moved to New Zealand. So I see my role as a PM as a context-bringing person to the team. Um, with my, well, colorful background, I find that my experiences allows me to jump around and provide context for people. When I was growing up, I was the one that was the friend in all of the different circles and brought them together at different stages. So for you guys that don't know what we do here at Blue Chili, we work with domain experts, our founders, to identify, validate, and then build scalable tech products. And we tend to work on three or four products at once as us product managers. Um, so basically, the need for strong pro process in what we do is, yeah, evident. So, I was doing a bit of research and trying to work out what, what's the best way to present this to you guys. And I felt that the outcomes of a bad kickoff meeting is the best way to set the scene. So what happens when you don't onboard your team well? You get lack of clarity, lack of consensus, so the decisions that are made uh, don't pull in the same direction, and lack of communication. People don't either know who to communicate to or when to communicate what, and people don't know what's interacting. So that's the big challenge for us PMs, right? How do we bring clarity, consensus, and communication to projects and products that we're building? Well, in short, it's process. But before we jump into what the process looks like, I think it's more important to understand what the context is. So what's a team made out of? People, right? So people come in very huge amount of different sorts, and they have different ways of doing things. As a product manager, it's our job to understand what each of our product teams needs to be able to do their job well. What do I mean by that? So we can give an example. As a product manager, we tend to be comfortable in the unknown. Our job is to find clarity, to find a way forward in building something. Our designers help us construct uh, the way forward by understanding the problem space and then creating wireframes and maps that allow us to give more context to those problem solvers in our teams, like our de developers, which give us the actual like uh, engineering prowess to build a great product. What does a successful team look like? They understand the purpose of their team. They know they can trust their teammates. They know what is expected of them. Disagreement and discussion is fostered rather than squashed. That means the leadership team needs to be flexible and decisions need to be made, uh, decisions are made when natural agreement is present. What that means is clearing out all the shit so that you can get your stuff done at the end of the day. So to get to this, we need to understand our team. And as I've just gone through, we've got different personalities and we've got to understand what each of them needs to be able to deliver their work well. I'm going to further illustrate this point by going through a bit of a case study. So one of the projects I worked on uh, over the last four months, it's actually still in production at the moment, is Sparrows. Um, Sparrows is a project that, or is a product, that uh, 
tracks high value time sensitive goods uh, in the logistics chain. Um, it does so through an IoT device and a platform. Now, the IoT device was something we discovered we had to produce. We were hoping we were going to be able to use something off the shelf, but through customer research, understanding of what people had tried and failed in doing, um, we discovered that we were going to have to build our own. So let me walk through a little bit about how that project happened. At the beginning of our project, um, it was me and the founder. Uh, we went out and did customer development uh, research to help uh, get context under what are the problems we're trying to solve. We brought this problem space to our design team. Our design team then helped us deep dive on these problems, providing wireframes and feedback loops to, uh, to us so that we could hone in on what the minimum viable product is that we could build. Once that was done, well, actually just as that was starting to happen, we realized that we needed to build our own software, uh, hardware. We were always going to build the software. Um, when we identified that, we onboarded our electrical engineer so they could run in parallel to the project and figure out how we're going to transmit live temperature and location through refrigerated vehicles. Um, so it's pretty interesting. It took us three weeks to get to that point. At that, from there, we took another month of customer development and uh, electrical engineering to make sure that we were building the right product for the right target audience. Um, and then we, then we onboarded our, found, uh, our development team. So that's when the kick-ass kickoff happened. Oh, hold on. There we go. So let's talk about the anatomy of a kick-ass kickoff. What do you guys think contributes to it? You guys are all very quiet, so I'm just going to jump in. So the outline for a kick-ass kickoff. Initially, you set the stage. At Blue Chili, this is an opportunity for our founders, or the customer, um, to come on board and meet the team. They have already met me, the product manager, and they've met the designers, because we've been working in parallel to make sure that they're aligned to the project. This is the opportunity for them to talk to the rest of their team and talk about their vision. Um, that helps align everyone in the team to make sure we're all pulling in the same direction. Roles really critical that everybody knows exactly what their role is in a, in a project team, who they're reporting to, and what piece they're in charge of delivering. After we do that, we talk about the risks, the assumptions that we're making, what those the risk assumption way off is, like is it risky enough that we have to go validate some more, or can we move forward and figure it out as we go? Also, if we foresee any issues in what we're working on. Finally, dependencies. This is one of the most important parts. It's understanding what needs to be delivered when and making sure that that overall uh, overarching roadmap is understood by everyone and who's in charge of delivering what and what dependencies are placed on it. Finally, success factors. Not finally, second to last, success <laughs> factors. <laughs> so success, success factors is understanding what we mean by success in our project. From the Blue Chili perspective, we want to build an MVP that can be launched as a pilot to give a moment of traction for the founder to see what breaks. Because at the end of the day, that's the initial part of building a great product, is understanding what's not working and then working to solve those problems with customer feedback. And finally, and definitely not least, is rolling out the communications plan. So what does that mean? <clears throat> At Blue Chili, we use uh, kind of a bit of a hybrid. Uh, we like to use Kanban um, as a way of keeping track of our project and using the Scrum methodology uh, as to give the artifacts, so the Scrum meetings, the stand-ups, et cetera, so that we have a consistent communication between all our team members. Does anyone have any questions about that? OK. <laughs> cool. In my view, as a product manager, our job is to bring the problem space to light and then empower our designers and developers to do what they do well, which is deliver on a great product. Thank you. Questions? Any questions? Fire. I like to get into the detail really quickly. <laughs> yeah, so balancing when it's the right time to bring them in is very important. 
And there's a couple touch points that I think are really important. The first one is when you're starting to think about solutions, bring them into sense check. They're engineers, they're problem solvers for a job. You know, like bring them into sense check the direction you're going. From my perspective, that's usually around when the user flows are in place. But that can change depending on the complexity of the project. Um, depending on the size of what you're working on, you may want your engineers to come in a little bit later or a little bit earlier. And that's really up to the product manager and an understanding of the developers that you work with. Some are very, very nuanced and need their space once everything's delivered. Others are okay with not having everything present. And that's something that you guys have to understand. Oh, that's a good question. Um, actually, before, yeah, definitely. Build the structure first, um, and then have the conversation within that kickoff meeting where you can actually flesh it out. So the kickoff meeting is not your first sprint meeting, right? So at that first sprint meeting, you should have your backlog mostly in place, and then sit down with the team to start organizing what's actually going to happen. Um, yeah, definitely. So one of the important things is actually having everyone on your side. So as a product manager, we spend a lot of time uh, with our teams, making sure that we're connected and that they understand what's going on. If there is someone that's not understanding what's going on, there's a couple ways you can tackle it. From my perspective, um, I like to jump in and understand why. It's usually that they don't understand something and they're not capable of articulating. it. So I, that usually solves the problem. If there isn't, then we may look to um, either swap out to someone else in our product team, um, change them into another project they're more interested in. Because most of the time it's around them taking, uh, having alignment with moving forward. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and the, the, the first part is the most important because 99% of the time you're going to find that there's something that they're not understanding or they're not connecting with on the project. And it, as a product manager, there's a bit of psychology there and jumping in and figuring out how we can engage with them and walk them through a conversation that will get them to the, to the point of understanding or connecting with them so that they can do the best job they can. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It can be in that, yes. <laughs> yeah. No, they do jump around at Blue Chili. So we have a reasonably small team of very flexible developers that are excellent at what they do. <laughs> we build sometimes like six to eight projects at once uh, with working on bugs and stuff from legacy projects as well. Yeah, and feature requests and stuff. Yeah. No, there would be no productivity. I'm just going to say, just to make sure that everyone can come. Do you want me to repeat that? I'll provide that answer. Okay, I was just going to say, we don't make developers' context switch as much as product managers. Uh, they tend to work through um, like a particular sprint before they move on to the next one. Anybody else? I think we're doing all right for time. Okay, cool. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Alejandro. Hello. Is this working? I'm pretty useless here. The next talk is by Richie. <laughs> Woo! Can I move this? I feel like I'm gonna Can knock it over. Right. Hello? Is this working? <clears throat> My name is Richie. I'm a product manager, like the other amazing speakers tonight. But I'm also a product designer. And this is actually where I started. So doing both of these roles actually presented a lot of challenges for me. But I did learn a lot. And one of the things I've learned was that 
these two roles have a lot of overlap. So what I'm going to be talking about tonight is one of these discoveries that I've had, and that is how the business model canvas can affect your design and product decisions. So let me take you back a little bit, give you some context about how I first started. So like I mentioned, I started in design. So I mean, I've heard about this, but I didn't really know what it was about. Like, it's just just boxes, right? Like, but I looked at it, I'm like, okay, cool. It's not that hard. Design boxes, right? Following. And I just fill it out, right? Like, I just go through each one, and I do it really well. I make sure I have enough detail in each one, and then I can make money, <laughs> right? Like, that's how it works. Well, apparently not. Like, I learned really quickly that it's not actually about the amount of detail you add to each of these boxes, but about the relationships they have with other um, components in this canvas. And, you know, looking at this, I was thinking about, actually, there's some similarities that this business model canvas has with, you know, the theory of product development. That section there actually corresponds to um, consumer, uh, customer desirability. The section on the left, feasibility. Can you actually get it done? And the bottom section, viability. Is it feasible? Is it, um, sorry, viable? Is it viable? Uh, <laughs> can you make money from it? Is it more than just an expensive hobby? So when you look at it as a whole, it's actually the relationships they all have with each other, just like product development, design. And when you look at this, it's something you iterate and something that constantly changes. So when I was looking at this, I thought to myself, how does this actually affect product decisions and how I actually design products and what I deliver and recommend? Well, I think the best way to go through it is with some examples. And yeah, there's a slide. Um, <laughs> let's, let's go with Lemonade. So, you know, like every other entrepreneur, you know, the whole classic thing of creating a lemonade stand on the side of the street. Let's create a business model canvas for lemonade. So, for example, our customer segment. Let's say, you know, our customer is parents with young children and we're trying to sell to them. You know, what value are we actually delivering it to them? What do they care about? You know, they're buying it for their children, so they most likely care about, um, you know, what's good for them. Um, and they don't want anything like super sweet, so it needs to be healthy, right? So the value proposition for them is a healthy alternative to soda. But, and once you have this, like, we need to figure out how do we actually create this product? How do we create something that's a healthy alternative? Well, you look at this side, and you know, what key partners you need to have, what uh, key resources um, and activities you need to do to be able to make this product by, um, feasible. And then once you have all of this, you understand what the cost structures are and how you're going to make money. So if this is your business model, how does this affect the product itself? Well, when looking at product, and let's start with packaging, for example. So with the packaging design, you'd probably want it to have um, a lot of information about how it is good for you, how it's good for your kids, what we can do, and the health benefits that it has. When you look at the recipe, you probably want less sugar, more vitamin C, you know, all the healthy stuff. Um, and the product, maybe natural color, not really like neon yellow, um, and appropriate serving size because lots of sugar can't be good for kids. And, you know, you can see that the, the design product decisions have been made based on the different elements of the business model canvas that was created. And, the business model for Canvas is something that you need to iterate and change all the time. And so how does that affect products as you change the business model Canvas? In the following kind of um, slides, I'll probably need some audience help, um, you know, to fill in the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> if you change customer segments from parents to children aged 10 to 14, how does that change the rest of the canvas? Does anyone want to jump in? There's no right or wrong answers, by the way. Well, can you expand on that? Okay, <laughs> cool. So, um, <laughs> so I'll just repeat that. Um, so the value proposition is going to change. 
Kids don't want anything healthy. They just want something nice, sweet, and delicious. Anything else? A cool touch. Yep, cool. So branding. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, price point will probably change. Yeah. So they don't have a bigger budget. They probably only have like pocket change. Yep. Yeah. Cool. So as you can see, just changing one thing changes so many things, right? It's a relationship between across, uh, yeah, relationship across all of these sections. Okay. Let's take a look at what the product might look like as you change that one thing. Well, the packaging, does it need packaging at all? Like, can you reduce costs by just delivering it in a cup instead of a bottle? Um, as we said before, they might not have as much money. The recipe, yeah, exactly, sweet and fizzy, you know, nothing healthy, like, why do we need that? And the product itself, like, maybe we can give them more value for their money instead, you know, just give them a large amount for a cheap uh, price um, because of that whole thing. So that was changing the customer segment. How about if we change something else? How about if we change the channel that um, we distribute? So what happens if we change the direct sales to uh, a wholesaler like Coles or Costco? Anyone want to jump in? Yeah. Ingredients packaging. Sorry, what was that? So would it be preserved for one? Cool. So, yep. Cost structure, yep. Marketing might save change the sales. Marketing, sales, yep. Cool. And I mean, if you look at the key partners, you're not selling them directly to people anymore. You'll need to include partners like logistics and packaging and like packing the whole thing, right? Okay, let's take a look at the product. So, packaging. Can it be a can or a juice box instead of a bottle? Something you can easily stack something you can package up nicely and ship it off. Recipe, longer shelf life. It will need to last longer than something perishable and homemade. You know? You'd never know how long people are going to um, keep the product for until it gets sold or consumed. And the product, you know, does it have to be in liquid form that you can you know, consume straight away? Can it be a cordial or a concentrate that people can you know, buy um, at a specific amount, but get a lot more value than just buying a single um, product. And also larger quantities. Um, what I mean by this is you're going to be selling a lot more now for less effort. Sure, your margin might be smaller, but it's a lot less effort than what you had to do before when you were selling it one-on-one. -on -one. So all of these different changes to the business model changes the product in different ways. And that's what I'm trying to get across. But if you look at all of the changes to the business model, they can actually belong to the same business. What happens if you start here, right? Like you're selling it to the parents, that's your first customer segment. As you've nailed that and the young kids grow up, maybe there's a new customer segment that you can actually approach and sell to. And then when they grow up and become parents and you become a bigger company in business, maybe you can start selling them in bulk, in you know, uh, Costco, Coles, and all of those things. So we do this a lot at Blue Chili. We make product and design decisions based on what our startups need and what our startups want to achieve with their business model. And I think it's best to go through one of our examples as well. So this is Theratrack, a project I worked on um, for our She Starts cohort about maybe nine to 10 months ago. Um, so what Theratrack is, is a digital platform to help therapists prescribe therapy sessions to clients outside of you know, normal one-on-one -on -one, um, clinic sessions. The problem that they were trying to solve was how do we get people, uh, people being clients and their kids, uh, sorry, the clients are the kids and then the parents, to be able to improve and hit their therapy goals in a really um, easy way and in a way that they can actually, you know, go out there and do whatever they want. Um, and be able to function as, you know, as normal kids do. Um, so in order to do that, we needed to find the problem. So the problem was therapists would prescribe these home programs on pieces of paper, like random scraps of paper. Here's a list of things to do. Go and do it. See me next week. So parents have a lot of mental load. They don't really 
you know, keep track of things that are just loose leaf and flying around in their car, for example. They might lose it, they might forget. Um, they're dealing with so many different things. Like, how do we fix that? And the first question that we had is, who is our customer? Is it the parents or is it the occupational therapist? There's value for both, but for multiple reasons, we've picked the occupational therapist. And the main reason is, if we can't get the therapist to use it, we won't be able to help the parent. So this brought up a few different questions. How do they run a therapy session? How do they currently set home programs? What does their environment look like? And what kind of technology do they use? As you can see, like, because we chose this specific uh, customer segment, these questions arise. But if we chose the other one, the questions would be completely different. This is what we came up with. We were able to look at the therapist's um, workflow as a whole and come up with a way to actually innovate their workflow in a session rather than just a digital alternative to admin. This allowed them to capture really meaningful information about their clients and send it to them in a way that the parents have all the information they need to do the activities at home. So what's next for Theratrack? Well, as I mentioned before, business models change and evolve, and Theratrack is evolving too. For the last six months, we've put, them, uh, put our product in clinical trials around Sydney, and we found that actually we may have gotten this customer segment a little wrong. So therapists don't actually work by themselves. They are most likely together and they belong in a clinic. But what does this mean? Well, before we were looking at the product as a one-to-one -one interaction and, uh, between the therapist and the client, but it actually should look like this. So what we're doing now is building a portal to help the app become a channel to the client. And I guess the biggest takeaway is don't be afraid to evolve your product. Don't be afraid to you know, test and experiment things. But what I do want to get across is that when you do make those changes, think about how your business model affects your product. summarize the question yeah. before responding? Sure. Um, the question was, um, do I have an experience, sorry, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> do I have an experience working with B2B products where um, there are two different needs on both sides, the user and the purchaser, but the sales team is focusing on the purchaser, but you know, the user is just as important, or how do we get that balance? Well, the whole business model canvas is about finding value, um, providing value, and extracting value. So when you look at that, if you're only leaning towards one side, your business is not going to be sustainable. You need to make sure that the whole thing flows. So it might sound like a cop-out answer, but um, you just need to find that right balance. You need to be able to deliver value to both parties without one party feeling left out. And it's only then that you can actually create that really good connection and really good customer relationship as well. Should be on. There we go. Uh, Richie, you got the clicker. <laughs> so apologies for having to use the handheld microphone, but they people who in women's clothes don't think we need pockets. So thank you, women's clothes designers. So my name is Cheryl Gledhill. I'm a product manager here at Blue Chili, like everybody else, and I'm here to talk to you about growth hacking. 
So I'm looking around the room and there's not too many people over 40 here. So what you guys call growth hacking, we used to just call working in digital. Um, <laughs> thank you for laughing at my joke, other guy over 40. Um, it, growth hacking is basically a way of growing either your revenue or your users to increase usage of your product. Yes, yes I am. Um, so this used to just be called the funnel, now we call it the growth hacker funnel. We're talking about how we attract, activate and retain users for your product. So here at Blue Chili, we take in a lot of idea stage founders. So people come to us with a napkin sketch and they're like, I think this would be a really great product where I'm going to solve X problem in the world. So we go out and create an MVP, we make sure we get product market fit, and then what? Does anyone here know what pirate metrics are? Apart from anyone, anyone, anyone? I saw one hand. The R. You got it. Do you know what it stands for? All right, I'm going to throw to Ben here. Well, oh, it's acquisition, activation, retention, revenue, and referral. And Ben's my boss, so I'm glad he got that right. <laughs> so we're basically looking at the acquisition part is your new users. Who are you actually attracting to your product? Of those users, how many are you actually going to activate? Like, are they just coming around to kick your tires or are they actually going to convert to an active user? How many of them can you keep? How can you actually monetize them? This kind of is the key here. And then how many of them will refer on their friends so you can actually keep growing your funnel? So the traditional methods of doing this are, you know, SEO, banner ads, things like that. In my past life before Blue Chili, a long time ago, I was kind of hired as the online marketing manager. And my big thing was banner ads because this was the early 2000s, um, that's what you do. Um, but I actually found the more interesting part was making the product better so you actually converted a lot more users. Banner ads are really boring to me. The, the people were like, whoa, we converted like 003% of people who saw the ad. And I was like, really? This, I don't know. To me, it seemed better to build a better product rather than flashing your banner ads out there and driving people to these horrible flash websites. So. I'm going to talk to you about the things that I think are a bit more fun than just kind of display advertising. So doing things that don't scale, I think, is one of the most interesting ways of growth, growing your business. And especially when we're talking about a lot of early stage startups, this is where the fun begins. So has anyone here heard of a little company called Tinder? Not dubbing anyone in here. There's one. <laughs> So um, Tinder have a chicken and egg problem, like most kind of two-sided marketplaces. And I hate to use people in these terms, but they have a supply and demand problem. You've got heterosexual women who are kind of the people that participate, that trigger the participation of men. So you get the heterosexual women to the platform, you then get the heterosexual men. So they call that supply side seeding, which is a horrible way of thinking of women. <laughs> but it is the way to actually get that network effect to take hold. So what Tinder did was they went around to colleges around America and they've got this whole collegiate Greek system going on where they've got fraternities and sororities. So if you've seen any American movies, you know how it goes, but it's actually a legit thing. So they go around sororities and they would have an employee from Tinder in a room with 30 women and they would download the app, they would go through one by one and set up these profiles. Then they'd go across to the fraternities and all these dudes would be like, whoa, I know that chick, she's single. And so the guys would all get on the app. They did this for three weeks around colleges across America and got 15,000 users and that was enough to drive the network effect where when somebody opened the app, they're like, whoa, there's all these on the app, which then drove more and more usage. So it's something that wouldn't scale, like you can't actually send someone around to onboard people onto your app, but in the early days, you've got um, the flexibility to do that. 
Um, Airbnb, um, I'm going to use them a lot in my examples because I think they're really interesting when it comes to growth. They've got that full hockey stick thing going on. So they looked at their statistics and they actually had a lot of traffic. They had a lot of people in New York particularly and in San Francisco, a lot of people who were hosting and they had a lot of traffic browsing, but they weren't getting a ton of bookings. So they looked at why and they were like, it was a gut feeling, but they're like, these photos are lousy. Like people are going around with their camera phones or they're not taking photos at all. So the founders got a great camera and they actually went door to door in New York. They visited every single person that had a listing in New York on Airbnb, convinced the homeowner to let them in, which in New York is no mean feat, took photos, put a watermark on it that said verified by Airbnb, uploaded them to the profiles. In the month that followed, they had, uh, I think it was two times the bookings, and then from there it grew exponentially because they really found that pain point of, okay, well, people don't really trust these listings, and it reached the point where they're like, hang on, if we've got this problem in New York, we've also got this problem in Paris and Portugal and Australia, and they set up the photography program where they get local photographers everywhere. Um, to take photos and they verify them and then they upload them. So they did this thing that didn't scale but actually ended up scaling really well to drive the business. Another thing Airbnb did is a lot of A-B testing. So when they set up in a new area, they found, again, with the chicken and egg problem, the problem is they need hosts for travelers to stay at. And they want a lot of people, there's not a lot of people who want to host in a new market. So they did this A-B test where they're like, okay, well, we're going to try Facebook ads that are targeted that basically say rent your place out when you're on holidays. And then they actually sent groups of two to three people on the ground to these holiday destinations. And they set up booths in the street where they're like, come and be a host. They did parties, they did info nights, they did flyers. And anyone who showed the slightest bit of interest, they would get their contact details, set up a profile for them, and send them an email that just said, click here to complete your profile. So that sounds like it doesn't scale. When they actually looked at the statistics, on the ground, actually being there in the city was five times the CPA, even though you had to pay for flights and the parties and everything else. But they also found out that actually gave two times the growth in each city um, for more people hosting and hosting. So again, it started off as a thing that didn't scale, but they do that every time they go into a new place now. Another interesting way of looking at how you're going to grow your business is actually piggyback off your competitors. So Airbnb's biggest competitor at the time, it wasn't actually the hotels, it was Craigslist, and this is where people were putting their listings. So they emailed every single person that had a Craigslist listing and they told them about Airbnb because Craigslist had the traffic, um, so they actually drove people from Craigslist over to Airbnb, and on top of that, they then reversed it and they said, if you your listing on Airbnb, we'll make it really simple for you to also publish to Craigslist. So they found lots of people were then coming to Airbnb because they're like, I can do two in one by doing this. So they're capitalizing on Craigslist traffic. Um, and then they found that because the user experience was a lot better, people were actually then staying on Airbnb and maybe not even spending any time on Craigslist at all. Internationalization is another way um, that a lot of companies are growing. So Canva um, had really pushed through, you know, they started in Australia, the, the unicorn over here. Um, but they've expanded to uh, like eight different languages and different countries. But they have found through their efforts, they actually need to have people on the ground in these cities. It's not just a matter of saying, oh, well, we're going to convert our site to Chinese and then, you know, if you grow it, they will come because there's all of these nuances that come with internationalization. Um, for example, there's different search engines, there's different social media, and there's actually different lifetime value of all of their customers. So they start really small. They've got, um, in China, they've actually got a pretty big team now, but in all of these places, they've got teams of two to three. And they set the playbook from head office in Sydney, and then they give them the autonomy to really grow um, those local markets in the local kind of culture. 
And Airbnb are the same. They have said that we actually find that growth starts from zero every single place we go because you've got all of the cultural issues that come along with internationalization. So it's a really hard thing to convince somebody to open up their home to a complete stranger. And they're actually starting from scratch everywhere they go. And developing new segments is another really interesting point of growth. And I asked you before who was on Tinder, and only one person put their hand. But <laughs> Tinder have done a really interesting experiment where they're like, well, you know, we've got all of the single people using Tinder, and it's a thing now, and they've used the gamification and everything else. But married people at least say they're not on Tinder. But how can we reach this extra market? So they've been playing around with this thing called Matchmaker, where it's like, well, you're not on Tinder, but do you feel like you're missing out? And you can actually match up your single friends using Tinder. So they're giving married people this real, expo not, I shouldn't even say married, people who are not generally on Tinder because they're in a relationship. Um, they're giving them the experience of Tinder because they're like, hey, match make with your friends. They're then getting the friends to get on Tinder and so they're really growing their market that way. And I think this is really interesting. It's actually, I was looking it up today, though. It's failed because I've taken it down. Um, but I think the kind of thought process behind that was like, well, these people aren't really on Tinder, but marriages don't last forever, right? So these people already know how to use it. <laughs> so you're kind of getting your market before they're ready, <laughs> which is very cynical of me. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to just leave you guys with a little bit of a challenge and just thinking about your business. How can you think of doing something that doesn't scale? Because we all think of things of like, hey, well, we're going to grow and we're going to do all of this. But what, what are the couple of the things that you can do to actually start growing your user base, whether it be revenue or getting more users or finding a different segment um, for your business? So you are now all growth hackers. Congratulations. You can update your LinkedIn profile as a growth hacker. Um, and yeah, you're ready to grow your business. Thank you. And I'd like to welcome Peter. Oh, were there any questions? Come on, really, how many of you on Tinder? Come on. There can't only be one person in this room. Two, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, down there. So the question was, do we have any examples in Australian setting of doing things that don't scale? Um, the first one that pops to mind, we've actually got a startup um, here that's just completed the program called Spark. Um, and his like elevator pitch is, um, it's putting kind of the Spark into your dating life because people in long-term relationships who are not on Tinder um, don't go out anymore because it's easier to sit on the couch. So he's like, once a month, I'm going to send you on this amazing date for like a monthly fee. And so he had the luxury of doing things that didn't scale where for each date, he actually like really handcrafts it where he's like, there's handwritten notes for them waiting at the table because he's got such a small user base. He actually can experiment with making people feel really special. And again, he can't do that once he's got 100,000 users, but while it's quite small, yeah, there's definitely a lot of things you can do with curation and really, like if you've only got 100 users, what could you possibly do to either in improve their experience or you know, attract new people when you've got the luxury of being small? Okay, so the question is, should you think about how you eventually scale it, or can you just... I think doing things that don't scale are all about learnings. Um, so, for example, with Airbnb, they found, when they went out with all of the booths in the street, they actually found it wasn't even so much talking to people and getting them on board and getting them hosting, but they actually found a lot of product um, learnings just from talking to people and onboarding them on the spot. Um, and they would have missed out of that if they were already thinking about, well, if this works, we're going to have to have a team of 800 people to be on the ground. Um, so I think it's actually okay to not think about how you're going to scale it because it is really about taking those learnings. Um, and once you've got, I mean, when you're doing things that don't scale, 
it's actually a success to fail. Like if you go out there and you're like, we're just going to try this experiment, I think failure is actually in some ways easier than a win because you're like, well, that didn't work, so back to the drawing board. Whereas if you win, it's like, oh, God, now how do I scale this? So I think you don't have to necessarily think about it in terms of scaling. It's about getting that learning. Any other questions? No? Okay, I'm going to pass on to Peter, who has pockets, so he has a little collar microphone. Hello. Can everyone hear me? I don't know if this is on. Hello? George? All right. Thank you. <laughs> Um, all right, so today I'm going to be talking about personas, um, what their place is, is in product, um, and maybe a different way of thinking about them. But first, I want to ask the audience what they're, what they're thinking of what a persona is. Anyone? Your ideal customer? Yep, well. Customer profile? Yep. A tool used by marketing that nobody else uses. A tool used by marketing that no one uses. Um, I'll keep that. <laughs> um, so I thought with my next slide, I'll try and kill two birds with one stone. And I tried to find the most generic persona template out there and also use it as an opportunity to talk about myself. Um, so quick little bio. Um, at one stage, Long time ago, I was also a growth hacker. So <laughs> you guys have also joined me now. Um, I've got a bit of VC experience. Um, worked in as a business and data analyst for over two years. And just prior to joining as product manager at Blue Chili, um, I co-founded Skin Charisma with my best friend, which is a skincare platform that takes the guesswork out of skincare products. I wanted to talk a little bit about what personas shouldn't be. Um, in my experience, they shouldn't necessarily be only demographic space, um, as, especially if you think about a fintech SaaS. Um, whether or not you know they're male or female, it doesn't really matter. Um, you shouldn't always use averages. So a recent finding from a statistician showed that the average human has one breast and one testicle. <laughs> that really doesn't really make sense. <laughs> um, personas shouldn't be made purely from assumptions. You need to validate it. You are not Steve Jobs. <laughs> not all your ideas are going to be absolute um, billionaire ideas. Um, and lastly, personas shouldn't be just an output. It shouldn't be a means to an end. And there should definitely be action that you can take after you've created these personas. So for me, a persona is first and foremost a communication tool. Um, it's a thing that you can use to share key insights with other people, um, especially when you're onboarding uh, new members to your team. It should be something that you can share with them and they can know straight away um, who you're trying to target. It should be a point of reference, and I can't emphasize this enough. As your product grows, as it pivots, and as you build more and more features, your personas are going to change. You shouldn't be able to keep a persona for a, for a very long time. It should be a living document. And that's why it should be a point of reference. And lastly, as for something product specific, it should be a prioritization tool. It should be something that with the right segmentation and the right distinguished features, um, it should be something that you can use to prioritize. <coughs> Quick question. What happens after personas are made? Hold off on that. Anyone? Anyone want to take a stab at what happens? That sounds like a great answer. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to try and summarize it. It's something that you use for communications. Um, definitely. It goes, on, <laughs> it goes on to the marketing wall and no one uses it again. Um, that is something that uh, I resonate with a lot. Um, in fact, for the longest time, I was an advocate of not using personas because that's exactly what they were. They were a piece of artifact that gets used um, that for, for discussion and then afterwards it's not used ever again. And that's why I wanted to talk about a, 
sorry, a slightly different framework to think about personas so that they can be a little bit more actionable. So this is the framework that I'm talking about. Um, it's got an X and Y axis and with a bunch of um, four distinct segments uh, created by these X and Y axes. I wanted to talk about how we get there because that's, that was a little bit confusing. Um, the first step I like to use is um, I try to find all the commonalities, the key characteristics and insights um, that are shared by all the users. Um, after that, I try and use those statements um, to set them apart. Um, and then next, I'll be able to create something like this. And lastly, I'll use several uh, tactics to validate whether or not that's correct. Um, so first, finding the commonalities. Um, I like to look at the big problem um, and the solution that we're trying to use uh, to solve this problem. So for skin charisma, we're trying to take the guesswork out of skincare. So I was able to succinctly find out that the commonalities, among others, um, all users have knowledge of skincare. And all users have some sort of need for skincare products. Now, these are very broad statements, but they cover the whole entire user base that we have. Um, and so, why does this matter? Like, why do these statements matter? Well, you can actually use these statements and turn them into questions which can set your users apart. And what do I mean by that? So for the example, for all users having knowledge of skincare, I've been able to ask, well, how much knowledge do they actually have? How much effort are they willing to put in? And where do they even get their knowledge from? Um, so these are the questions that I'm going to be using to understand and segment the users that we have. I like to also think about putting those answers onto a spectrum. So for how much knowledge do they have? Some might have none, and some might be very knowledgeable. Um, and, and very much so, I can do that for the second statement. So all users have some sort of need for a skincare product. I've been able to determine, well, do they need that skincare product? Is it a luxury? Is it a necessity? How much are they willing to actually spend, right? Um, so that was a lot to take in. And I thought I'd do a pop quiz. Oh, sorry. No pop quiz. It's a hard <laughs> moment first. Um, so there. So with this, and so with all these kind of questions that you've been able to use, um, you can actually match that up, just as I have. So with here, I've looked at the necessity. And I've said, OK, is it a luxury or is it a need? Um, and how much knowledge do these people have? Is it a low amount of knowledge or is it a high amount? Um, and from here, I've been able to create four distinct segments. Now we're up to the pub quiz. Can we do this for Uber? Who would like to go, have a go at crafting a statement um, that applies for all users of Uber? So think about the common traits or characteristics for Uber users? They want to travel. Sorry? They want to travel. They want to travel. Yep. They have smartphones. They have smartphones. Yep. They already use taxis. They already use taxis. Yep. So they already use taxis. So they're already used to paying for the service. OK. They are, they're used to paying for transport. Um, so. One of them is actually what I brought up. So people want to get from point A to point B. So indeed, that has to be like that is Uber's you know problem that they're trying to solve. So you know instinctively, every user who uses Uber would be someone who wants to get from point A to point B. So from that statement, um, does anyone have, want to take a crack at how you can use that to um, look at how you can set your users apart? Distance? Yep. Yeah. Distance? Cost? Cost? Time. Time? Yep. How many people in a cab? How many people in an Uber? Yep. Sorry. Um, yep, Th those are all actually very valid ones, and even ones that I didn't think of. Um, so I had, um, how often do they go from point A to point B? Um, how far away are the two points from you know point A to point B? Why are they going? Um, and then. Where are they going? There's so many questions that you can use, that you can create 
from this one single statement, which applies to all your users. So what happens after that? How can we make sure that you've cut this up in the right way? Um, the, the first thing that I like to do is I like to think about, well, can you find common traits within each one of these segments really quickly? Um, if you can't, if you can't fill out these Lauren Ipsums, it might be time to go back to the drawing board and try and cut it up in a different way. Um, because this should be something that should be relatively easy for you to think about, um, especially if you know a lot about your users and a lot about your product. If you can't, however, well, this is where we go into customer research and data and analytics. So for customer research, um, one of the biggest problems I see with personas um, and people using personas is that they use it as an excuse for not, using, for not doing customer research. They think that with these personas in mind, I don't need to do customer research anymore. I already know all I need to know about customers. That's not true. In fact, personas should be something that you can use as an excuse to understand what are your assumptions um, and what have you actually validated. Um, the second way of doing it is validating through analytics. So very much so, uh, Grubhub, um, someone, does anyone know Casey Winters? Very big uh, growth person. Um, he was able to find for Grubhub very early on that the things that he had, he had to um, dissect was how if whether or not the payments were spontaneous um, and whether or not people were buying um, for themselves for each other. And he was able to do that through data and analytics. Um, so what can we actually do with these kind of segments? Uh, first and foremost, you can get to know your users better. Um, you can understand their motivations and understand their pain points. You can prioritize your users. Um, think about these four distinct segments and think about the lifetime value, the customer acquisition costs, the revenues that you'll be able to achieve. So I've done this here. Um, you know, if you have the, the right data and the right analytics, you'll be able to understand for each one of these distinct segments, which one of you, which one of them are you able to make more money? What is the market opportunity for each of these? Um, and lastly, you can prioritize the features. So this is an exercise that I love doing. Um, but you can actually understand for each one of your segments how many of the, how many of the features in your product help that segment. And from here, you can look at whether or not that aligns with what your business wants. Perhaps we were trying to target experts. Perhaps we weren't. Perhaps we were trying to target the influencers, but we have a lot of features for experts. Why is that? Do we need to reprioritize what we're trying to build? Um, the possibilities are really endless with this kind of framework. Um, the idea is, is that this is just um, the foundation of where you're going. And this is what I was very much saying in terms of making your personas actionable. It's something that you're able to do a lot and you're able to complement a lot of frameworks with this idea. So hopefully I've turned you into a believer of personas. If I haven't, or you can talk to me afterwards, or you can just, you know, keep it out of your toolbox. But um, thanks for listening. <laughs> Any questions? No questions? No? Nope? Okay, cool. I will pass it to Ben. <laughs> I wasn't allowed slides, so I don't have any. Uh, all right. So I should probably provide some context on this. Um, so Cheryl already mentioned I'm their boss. Um, and I have the audacity to essentially ask them to give a talk in the, like, you know, in the Christmas, in the lead up to Christmas when it's always stressful. Um, how do you define that so far? Anything useful? Yeah, I see a couple of people nodding. Yeah, okay, let's do this. If you thought that was amazing, you stomp your feet on the ground. We'll say hello to the Cuban downstairs. If you thought that was okay, just clap. And if you thought that was rubbish, just don't say anything. So, let's ask that again. How was that so far? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, thank you. Um,
should add some notes here. No, no. I, I, sorry, I wrote down even more notes while I was listening. Um, okay, so the team is actually incredibly humble. Uh, I should say something else about how this came about. Um, so, I over the last few months of um, of me, well, before I joined Blue Chili, um, I did um, a bit of consulting, uh, and I also teach product management at General Assembly, um, and I have a coaching group at Airtasker of like, different product managers, um, and so I ended up building a little framework to assess product management capabilities that looks at all the different. Um, I guess, life stages of a product and all the different aspects of building products. Um, and so I, I pinged the tool to the guys and gal and, um, and asked them to fill that out. And so I handpicked an area for their talks, which they felt not necessarily as strong in, um, based on my experience of essentially having to teach all sorts of product management topics at General Assembly that I wasn't even comfortable with. And it was a great experience actually getting into a topic, looking up, teaching people, uh, engaging with them and asking, oh, well, so how have you guys done that before? And then you learn kind of as you speak. Um, so the, the guys, uh, they're very humble about themselves, didn't even necessarily introduce themselves. So uh, I guess there's a couple of things that I do want to say about them. Um, but yeah, a few weeks ago, they were relatively weak in these areas. And now they gave these amazing talks. Uh, so Alejandro is actually um, an interesting case. He had a um, he had a growth agency uh, that grew so fast that he started running into growth issues um, <laughs> and had had a bit of a self fulfilling prophecy there. Um, Cheryl has been in in like working on the internet stuff. Uh, I think before I even had a computer um, and and has helped to build Yahoo and, and those kind of companies. Um, and uh, and Peter has. Um, um, has well, like you introduced yourself a little bit, has worked in VC, has actually done growth hacking on a startup that managed to exit at the end. Um, and Richie is just one of the kindest and, and most awesome people I knew. And I actually thought his presentation for a designer looking into business models was incredible. And even I learned a lot from these presentations. So thank you guys. Um, all right. So as part of me um, asking them to um, essentially talk about stuff that uh, they feel like yeah, they, they know some stuff about, but they're not really comfortable, I told them they can just pick my topic. Um, and so they came up with just do a bit of life coaching. So this is the kind of stuff that happens essentially behind closed doors uh, when I teach the GA course or when, I, uh, when I'm at Airtasker in one of the meeting rooms, a bunch of well, PMs from Airtasker and OneFlare and other places kind of come together. And so we talk through different, um, different topics and, and little, um, little case studies, essentially. Um, and so the idea is that I give you guys a product problem. Um, and, uh, and you guys tell me how you would approach that. And I'll tell you what maybe the advantages and disadvantages of the, of the approach are. Um, and help, well, ideally, each and every one of you to become better product managers. So we'll see how that goes. It's a little bit of an experiment by itself. Um, and I have to ask, I have to ask, was I meant to say anything yes. here? Yes? yes. Thank you. Sorry. So Ben is going to ask a product question. And we want everyone to go to slido.com with the event code and put what you would do in that circumstance. And then he's going to go through and dissect the answers. So we need a lot of audience participation. So if you go to slido.com and put in that code. We're not affiliated with slido.com by any chance. This is not a growth hacking tactic. Awesome. All right. So you have to do this on your mobile. Um, so I'll give you a second. Uh, slido.com. And then while you're looking at your mobile, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the code. It's is a hash data. Yep. Hash capital M. Oh, it doesn't. Oh, OK. So just M201. 209. Two, so 209. God, I'm. I took this morning off because I started getting a bit sick. Uh, so my brain is only at 50%. So if I get 50% right, then yeah, that's about where it should be. All right. OK. So the first problem, I'm cheating here a little bit because that's unfortunately a problem I know very well. Let's say you start, uh, ha oh, I should ask, has anyone worked with Jira? Jira, yes, a couple of people. OK, so it's a project management tool for software teams uh, by Atlassian. Um, and if you had to use it, sorry, I used to be one of the PMs. Um, and, uh, but I, I swear it wasn't all my fault. So uh, let's say you just became a product manager at Atlassian. And someone told you, so Jira, like this tool that we built for software teams. We hear these stories every once in a while that people also use that in business teams, marketing, finance, recruiting, that kind of stuff. 
Uh, and, you know, we want to grow into, like, we want to help all sorts of teams become uh, better at solving problems. So we want you to kind of figure out how you can, how we can grow Jira into business teams and, and have more marketing and finance and recruiting teams of the world using this thing. Uh, good luck. So what do you do? It's essentially Mike Cannon Brooks coming to you and saying, like, make me more money. I was not very clear. Do you want to? So if you go to this URL and um, if you answer, like, if you were the product manager with this particular problem, what would you do next? So Ben saying um, there's lots of people who aren't traditional developers using Jira. How do we actually grow into these markets? So what do you think you would do if you were the product manager? And I'm going to see the answers over there. Are you going to read the answers out? Ah, wonderful. Okay, find out why users are using Jira um, is, is one. And the other one is understand those teams and the processes and problems. Uh, okay, now they're really coming in. Thank you, guys. Um, maybe I should I start with, uh, with one. So obviously, yes, finding out what should we? Cool. Thank you. Of course, the boss is the least organized one. I'm, I'm right on here. Okay, so uh, so first answer was um, it, uh, so after finding out why they're using Jira, great first step. Um, ah, um, uh, understand those teams, their processes, and problems. Okay, so. Understanding the like the finance teams and marketing teams and, and their process and everything is generally a good step. The challenge in the Jira team was we had a lot of use cases, right? There wasn't just one that we picked um, where we said, oh, we want to now grow into I don't know, design teams or finance teams, right? We had all these different use cases. So when you do these contextual inquiries, trying to focus on essentially all of them at the same time um, is a little bit of a um, uh, well of an effort. Right, so you want to essentially limit your effort a little bit and just first figure out, well, which ones of those are going to be the next one, right? Um, so maybe before you, before you uh, focus on their process and problems, figure out what's actually the biggest, um, the biggest use case, right? Um, and, and yes, understand why they're using Jira in the first place. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so next one, interview a, G a few Jira users from different business functions, find out how the G use it, how they use it, <laughs> so good, um, why they use it and what their turn are. Uh, that's excellent. So that's exactly basically what I did. Um, I looked into why they're using it in the first place, um, as discussed, um, but also what alternatives they have tried, like what are they using Jira instead of? Right? What's your competition in each of these markets and what's driving them towards Jira? Um, yeah, that's good. Uh, Rebrand a new product that is directed to marketing and business customers. <laughs> um, so we thought about that. Uh, just taking uh, Jira and labeling it as something different, Jira for marketing teams or whatever, um, and essentially, yeah, just selling it to the marketing and, and uh, sales teams. Um, the reason we didn't just go ahead with that was we didn't really know if it was the, uh, like you're making the assumption here that it's the head of finance or someone from the finance or marketing team that's adopting Jira, right? It's them coming to the Jira website uh, and saying, cool, I now want to use Jira and I set up the system up that looks like it was built for dev teams, but it'll surely work for me as well, right? Um, and so that one we very, very quickly actually invalidated. Um, when we when we looked into how the adoption comes about from those business teams, right? So you're jumping one step too too quickly there. Um, and uh, what we actually I should probably get into it. Uh, what we actually found out was the teams that are using Jira, the business teams, they never thought of using Jira. But what they did was um, once we looked into how the adoption comes about, they essentially came to the um, uh, to the uh, IT admins in their company 
uh, and said, hey, we've got this kind of business problem. That's the kind of workflow we want to facilitate. Um, and can you help us with this? Do we have a tool there? Sometimes they even had a tool in, in place. And so they just made the rounds between IT admins and finance and legal to just get approval for this new system that was going to cost them 50,000 a year or something. Um, and the IT admin would, uh, would come up to them and say like, hey, I think what you're trying to do, we can do with Jira. And I can set that up for you this afternoon and you can use it tomorrow. Right? And that was a huge game changer for them. Right? Um, it essentially made the IT admin the superstar. Suddenly they didn't need legal, they didn't need the security team to approve anything, they didn't need finance to approve a budget. The system was already there and the whole timeline from rolling the system out went from six months to one day. Right? So once we realized that was essentially the superpower of Jira and what makes it go into teams and markets that we had never intended, um, we were like, that's something we need to double down on, right? So the, the real trick in like that, or what we found out through the customer research and why people are using it and what they're using it instead of and how the adoption comes about, these were the three key questions, was they're not interested in Jira. They just went to the IT admin and that guy sold it for us. Right? So we needed to give the IT admin more tools to essentially uh, go out there and champion Jira inside the organization. At the end of the day, we were making their life easier as well. Instead of having to maintain and update and get the grips with yet another system, they could just consolidate a whole lot of stuff in their organization on one system. Right? So, so the IT admin was essentially our customer. Everyone else was just a user, to be honest, which is interesting. Right? Like a lot of other organizations like Salesforce and HubSpot, et cetera, they focus on that head of marketing, et cetera, as their customer. So this has something to do with Richie's talk. Right? Once you change your customer, Right, from the mother to the kid, um, which is somewhat similar with, you know, from IT admin to, uh, to you know, actual like head of some department. Uh, yeah, your, your whole product and the way you position it, the way you roll it out can change. So, okay, cool. Um, mm, 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 validate that those customer segments need a tool like Jira. Uh, yeah, you can do that. When you have a new product, um, or when you're, when you're looking into certain segments, um, you can go in there and validate the need for the tool. But what you have already is a solution, and you're just trying to look for a use case. Um, and, uh, and so that can be challenging. Right? And the question is, what is really the, tool, the need for a tool? Because a tool is just a tool. The need is a job that you need to get done. And you can get it done lots of different ways. Right? I mean, if we think about it, um, organizing teamwork we used to do a thousand years ago, way before computers, right? And we just did it maybe with paper. When was paper invented? Longer ago, right? Okay, just want to make sure I tell the truth here. Um, yeah, so, so the, the luxury situation we were in, we were picking a segment that was already using our product and we just had to go deeper in why they're using it and how this whole thing comes about. So typically when you're trying to expand to a new segment, um, it will be adjacent to the target group or to your key persona that you're targeting already. Um, and, um, and so you won't necessarily have to validate if there's a need. You can just, well, expand kind of from one pond to another. The chances are if, you're, if you've got really good product market fit, um, one of your target groups or someone in, your, in that next target group is using your product already, right? Uh, whether you know about it or not. We did actually um, think at some stage about putting a, a survey inside Jira. Um, like whenever people were creating a new project for them to tell us, hey, which team are you in? Um, but it was, it was just going to be too painful. So we just ran a survey across all our customers and, and then saw uh, the kind of the most likely use cases and the least likely use cases for Jira and business teams. Alrighty, so the next answer was, the ability to hear to, to just to thumbs up all the answers. I'm going to do, I'm not sure if you guys are going to see that. I'm going to do this later, but they're all great questions. Uh, okay, so talk to the business teams who are using it already and find out why they chose to use it. Yes, yes. Um, and second, talk to teams who chose not to and find out why not. Uh, this is great. This um, relates to a, a paradigm which I talked about recently, uh, which is the survival bias. Has anyone heard of the survival bias? Yes, yes, awesome. Who's not heard of the survival bias, I should probably ask. A few more, okay. So, so the survival bias um, is, is a really, really great and powerful growth technique. Right? 
Um, and so it comes from a story in the Second World War, um, where I think the Allies or the Americans, they were losing lots of planes and they were looking at how they can strengthen and improve the, the build of their planes um, to increase the survival rate. So they looked at the plates that came back and looked at where they got hit the most and, um, and then strengthened those areas, right? And you would think, well, if we strengthen those areas where they get hit the most, more of them come back. Fortun unfortunately, it had no impact whatsoever on the survival rates because they were looking at the planes that came back already, right? So a lot of product teams get stuck in kind of asking the customers that are already using their product, hey, how can we make the product better, right? And while for a while that's okay, um, until your product is really sticky, at some stage you've got to ask the customers who didn't uh, keep using your product or who never signed up to it um, why, uh, why they're not using your product. Right? Um, and so what the, um, what the allies or the, the Americans uh, did at the end of the day is they checked out, um, once they landed already in Normandy and stuff, all the planes that kind of didn't make it back and figured out that the planes that didn't make, uh, that didn't make it back were hit in the engine room. So sure, right, if, if as a plane, if you don't have an engine anymore, then you won't get very far. Uh, so they started strengthening those and suddenly they were winning a lot more battles and, and a lot of them survived. Right? So the same thinking you can now apply to, to product management. Um, so this is, a, this is a great point and it's a very powerful technique. Doesn't necessarily work for startups, like really early stage startups, right? When you just come up with an idea, you've got your first product, don't ask all the people who are not interested in your product why not, because suddenly you will just come up with lots and lots of ideas, put everything on your backlog, and suddenly you're building, I don't know, like everything, right? Uh, like, like you're building the, 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 you know, the one ring for the world of IT systems. Uh, it's not going to work. Uh, okay, good. Uh, meet and talk to potential users. Um, yes. Meeting users is good. Now it says potential users, so I have to say also talk to the one that are already using it. Right? These are two different segments um, that you can that you can use. Um, it's actually it's actually fairly complicated to just go out in the street and figure out whether someone is a potential user or not. Um, so chances are the people who sign up to your product or are interested in it in a way um, might be better fit. But I will say we did. Um, we did reach out to customers who never used any of the uh, Alassian systems. Um, and so we, we had to use a kind of uh, customer, what was it called? Like a user test kind of recruitment agency um, who was going to find those people and pre-qualify them. Have you ever heard of Alassian or Jira? And they said no. And so then we knew they were interview targets. If they were in those business teams that were well known to us of, of sometimes using Jira. Um, and so we could interview those. So yeah, but they're two different target groups and your, the data that you get back that you make decisions on will depend on whichever one you focus on. Alrighty. I will try to identify what other companies are using Jira. This is actually, sorry, this is, this, I'm not, I, don't, I don't like to make fun of people um, and, I, and I won't, but there is, this is actually something that Germans do a lot. They pronounce it Jira um, because that's what it looks like in German. Um, and sorry, I'm German, so I can make fun of Germans, I hope. Um, and um, I, I'm pretty sure this is just a typo. Um, but it's interesting because all the Germans, when, you, when we go to conferences, there's always lots of Germans because they love Jira because it's so flexible and it's like their ideal IT system because they can just do everything with it. It really works for an engineer's mind. So anyway, they always pronounce Jira and we kind of have to subtly correct them. That's called Jira. Anyway, uh, so what was I? Um, uh, I would try to identify what other companies are using Jira to conduct interviews to determine what features they would find valuable from the software. Um, yeah, so we, we actually did exactly that as well. Once we interviewed the companies that were already using Jira in business teams, uh, we interviewed the like, IT admins once we knew that that was our target group and we're essentially trying to figure out so what, um, like, what made them successful in terms of convincing other teams to use Jira? Because it had all the software, software language and, and stuff all written all over it, right? Like they were, um, they were essentially, like everything in Jira is not a task, it's an issue because it comes from a bug tracking system. So suddenly you talk to recruiting teams and they have to call their candidates issues. But they're not issues, they're like, you know, an amazing opportunity to improve the company. Um, and so, so they have to get over the language barrier of, well, it's issues and uh, that's something, like everything has a version and a resolution, whether it's fixed or not fixed. And so all this kind of terminology didn't necessarily work for them. So some people would 
go to the IT admins and say like, look, we just can't use that, right? Like the whole terminology just doesn't work for us. It looks weird, we feel odd, we're just gonna pay a thousand dollars a month for another system. Um, yeah, so changing the terminology was one option. Um, however, that is one of the feature requests that we didn't end up following through on because it would mean changing the whole system. So of course there's a lot of value in expanding to a new target group, but if you have to change everything in like the term issue is literally everywhere in the user interface. Um, and I tried every, every trick in the book to convince the teams that, but we should try it. And, um, and uh, in hindsight, I probably should have stopped sooner uh, than I did with trying to convince them. Um, but yeah, we, we ended up not changing the terminology and just gave the IT admins other tools to show people that Bajira is built for business teams, even as, if it has a bit of a wacky terminology. Uh, Alrighty. Uh, new product problem? Okay, cool. Uh, let's go with the new problem. Do you still have this thing open on your mobiles? Because uh, this is going to do. I messed up all my slides, uh, or non slides. I can't remember what this is, but I remember it. Okay, so I read a really cool uh, interview question the other day. Is anyone interviewing for product management uh, jobs? We're, sorry, we're not hiring right now, but um, maybe later. Um, sorry, usually when, when we do these things, all the sponsors always announce, and we're hiring product managers, and we're just doing this altruistically. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, anyone looking for product jobs at some stage or has interviewed? Uh, yes, maybe, yes, a couple of people. Okay, so, so there was a really interesting question on Twitter the other day, which I think the number one interviewer at Google was like, yep, I'm going to take that one. Um, and it got me intrigued as well. So usually the typical interview questions are, what's your favorite product and how would you improve it? Um, and hey, this metric went down and your CEO needs to know why it went down. Uh, what do you do? So this one is different. Um, I got to ask at some stage, how much of product management is really stakeholder management? And at that time I said jokingly, I don't know, 80%. And then I realized, oh shit, it basically is 80%. So the, uh, the interview question uh, was your CEO comes to you and uh, gives you a project uh, that is uh, fill a, fill a uh, bus with, uh, with tennis balls. And uh, your challenge is to essentially convince uh, design, development, legal, finance, etc., cetera, um, to get behind this project without any real metrics and measures of success. So uh, the question for you guys is, how do you convince stakeholders to like, execute on a project that you find and that they will probably find pretty damn useless? Huh? The project was fill a, fill a uh, school bus with tennis balls. I think it's I think it's a a one plus on the old uh, Google interview question of how many how many golf balls can you fit in a school bus um, and now your CEO actually wants to do that and try that. Well, we can simplify this. We could just have a think about okay, what is the what is the best way to motivate one of the target groups? Like, how do you motivate legal to do anything? How do you motivate engineers to follow a project uh, that they don't really believe in? I'm looking at you, Mitch. You'll have a good answer. Uh, Mick, sorry. <laughs> Brain doesn't work. Uh, OK, we've well, got a first answer. Focus on strong intangibles and emotional connect, uh, connect benefit uh, for users. Yeah. Focusing on the user as opposed to CEO is, is going to be one way of doing that. Um, I think often in, especially for design, I feel like that works. Like designers, I'm sorry, I, I, I'll put all of you in a shoebox now. Um, designers tend to be very empathetic people, so they might not believe in the project and its purpose, but they love satisfying the user and building something that's really great for users. So um, actually building some sort of connection of how maybe the CEO's six-year-old daughter will love this school bus filled with tennis balls um, and how it's going to be, you know, pictures of this piece of art are going to be used in marketing and how uh, all these things, I don't know, who knows, maybe that, that will work. I don't know. Um, I look at one of our designers right now and she's fairly skeptical. <laughs> Um, okay, but yes, connecting to, to the user as opposed to the internal stakeholders who are driving the project can be a good one. Okay, 
uh, think what's in it for them and understand what drives them. Yes, very good. At the end of the day, um, you're, as a product manager, you're a little bit of a champion, right? And to some extent, while people don't report to you, um, you're a little bit of a motivator and, and still in a leadership position. So all the stakeholders around you, including, yes, legal, finance, uh, but also development, design, understand what actually motivates them. Um, and find some sort of connection to them, right? Some developers will just want to work on new technology um, and maybe they can work on a new development framework to fill this bus with golf, uh, sorry, tennis balls. Um, or maybe, you know, they like, they don't want to sit in front of a computer. They actually want to talk a problem th uh, through with people. So, well, here you go. Perfect project for you. Development opportunities. Okay. Uh, working out the potential ROI for the business. Um, I'm going to say that's cheating because we already defined uh, that the uh, that the project has uh, has no real metrics. So ROI means there has got, got to be some dollar figure attached to it, um, and we're just going to say we have real problems um, to define the ROI. Sure, usually you would want to do that in in projects, figure out where the ROI is. Um, with this one, we're going to say no, nah, we kind of can't. Also, it's making the assumption that people will be motivated by essentially the CEO and the business making more money, but if they don't get a bonus or they don't have any stock options in the business, they could just get their flat salary, they couldn't care less about how much money the business makes. They only care about, like, you know, are they going to get off at five and are they going to still get paid tomorrow? So maybe not even the best one. Uh, okay. How much time do I have? Two more minutes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I've got to go through some quickly. Uh, make make conscious of how many balls can fit into a bus and then use this way to validate it. I'm not sure if I understand this right. If this is a, a, a contest between the developers who can fill who can fill it the fastest or the fullest. Um, but yes, gamification at work um, is a good one. Um, maybe I should make my product managers go like, who can build the most products in in a month? Okay, they're not very impressed. Let's not. Let's not. Um, okay, good. But yes, yes, some sort of uh, game system around that, right? In fact, um, I, I'm just going to use Atlassian again. Um, they do their quarterly hackathons, their ship it days, right? Um, and some of the developers will, or not everyone in the company sees value in them, or they don't necessarily. There was a time where um, a lot of the developers would work on their little pet projects and, and little ideas, um, and a lot of the non-technical people were not necessarily involved in those, in those hackathons, right? They felt like it wasn't really for them. But Alassian wanted to involve everyone at essentially um, uh, like having a bottom-up model, to, uh, a bottom-up kind of approach to innovation and to making the organization a better place. Um, so they just created a new award, the non-technical ship it award. Um, that was given out to all the non-technical projects. So suddenly, there were a lot more people spending one day or two days a quarter or something on essentially a project that was not related to their key core metrics because you could win an award. And it was also fun. Uh, so yes, that's awesome. Uh, come up with a value convincing enough, such as if that is done, donations to charity will be made. Okay, yeah, similar. Um, that's actually really cool. Um, in fact, that's, uh, that's kind of a growth, growth hack I uh, deployed here, um, that we're going to make this a charity event. And if you haven't donated to Oz Harvest yet, uh, don't, let, don't let my little experiment here ruin it. Um, <laughs> donate for the, for the guys and girls. They were awesome. Uh, okay, ask the CEO to define the purpose of the project and communicate to the team. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> The CEO has already put you in charge, so going back there, it's like, mate, can't you tell them like how this is useful because I really don't see it? It's not going to get you very far. Okay, I get told I have to wrap it up, um, but I hope you found that interesting. I certainly found the suggestions interesting. I learned a couple of things here, um, and uh, and maybe we're going to make this an annual thing or something. Uh, Just want to say um, thank you very much. Fantastic presentation. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I reckon we've probably got two minutes for questions. Any? Verbally. Does anybody have anything burning in the back of their mind that they would like to ask just before we close out? By all means, come over for the mic. <laughs> Ah. <laughs>
<laughs> so, so say, thank you very much, everybody, for coming and spending some time with us. Thank you very much, Ben. Oh, we've got a couple more. No, I just need to uh, say something. Oh, of course, yeah. Go, go for it. Were you going to were you going to say something else as well? I was going to say thank you because oh. the way that you were managing things and taking people's questions and feeding your thoughts back was going really well, and it seemed a little awkward for you to have to close out your own presentation oh. without us saying thank you to you. So, thank oh. you to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. I just need to uh, need to make a couple of quick announcements. Um, there'll be more foods and uh, food and drinks, so I know I'm in a dangerous place here. Um, okay. So Oz Harvest, I already mentioned. If you enjoyed uh, any of the talks, um, please donate. Uh, we'd very kindly appreciate that. We don't have a way of tracking it, um, but we we do strongly believe that you're all decent human beings. Um, all right. We would also like uh, a little bit of feedback. Um, if you know the product space, you know how it is, um, you can't really live without any useful feedback. Um, so we set up a, a little link, a little survey. Um, I said there, oh, I thought I had to tell people. Uh, bluechili.com slash bite-sized. Um, it's a very, very quick one-minute survey. The guys would appreciate any feedback on their speaking styles in terms of the content. Um, if we ran this kind of event again, maybe next year for Christmas or something, um, I already had to promise the, uh, them a, a bottle of champagne. Um, but uh, be because this was such an awful experience that I put them through. Um, but uh, yeah, any any suggestions from you guys would be really uh, really valuable, right? You um, you spent uh, what a couple of hours or so here now. Um, so if you have any thoughts, please let us know, um, either the individuals or uh, or us as group. And last but not least, um, as part of Product Tank, uh, I've got a really really exciting thing, um, which is uh, as product managers we're always trying to learn and improve, and so I mean that's why we do these events. Um, and with Product Tank, I wanted to bring like really practical talks that share some of the best practices of product managers with the community. Um, and so one of the events per year that, that I look forward to is Mind the Product, um, which is the original kind of um, uh, like the, the conference from the uh, Product Tank guys. Um, and I think they originally ran it in London, and then they brought it to San Francisco as well. And in March, it's actually kind of come to Singapore. I think flights to Singapore are like $200, $300 or something. So there's almost no excuse not to go if you can uh, find a sponsor for it. Um, um, we've got our CFO sitting over there. Yes, um, I'm going to hit him up for, for budget sooner or later. Um, I seeded this well because earlier I asked him for $30. So I'm going to slowly but surely <laughs> increase it and see where the line is. Um, yeah. So, so, um, so my the product uh, MTP Con Singapore um, is I think 25th to 26th March, um, and that's it. So thank you so much for sticking with us. Uh, enjoy the rest of the food and drinks. Otherwise, it's going to go to waste. And we're donating to Oz Harvest, so we don't want that. So get um, get your pre-Friday drinks in. And um, thank you very much. We'll see you next time.